So he is going to give us an hour talk. So you guys, let's give Mike a warm welcome. So thanks everybody. Can you, I've got those before. Can you hear me okay? Right. Yep. So let's hold it close. Uh, which button do I hit to get my slide just in? That top? Yep. Yeah. So my talk here is DFIR 101, Cones, Drones, and Prison Phones. Um, uh, I learned yesterday I have a lot to say, so I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to try to get as much as I can. So why am I here today? Uh, a few years ago, I was getting burned out. I was looking for something new to do, hands-on keyboard. Somehow I stumbled into digital forensics. I reached out to some people on Twitter. I was like, hey, can you talk to me about your day job? I'd like to learn more. And uh, I got in touch with the vendor who said, come to our conference, that you're going to give me a gift pass in Myrtle Beach. Uh, spent a lot of time on the vendor floor, uh, talking about products, what, learning what they do, how they use them, and found out this was very law enforcement target. Uh, so we're going to talk about the process of getting information, what we look for, that type of thing. Uh, I did make the joke that Spot the Feds was very easy at that conference, and they didn't appreciate that. <laughs> not really very well at all. So, uh, so what is DFIR? It's short for Digital Forensics Incident Response. These are two topics, similar process or similar ideas, different processes, different timelines. Uh, incident response is what probably most of us have been involved with sometimes. Something is gone wrong. Like something's happened, we, we need to react. We need to take care of the problem. We need to find out what it is. We need to contain it. We need to get people back up and running. You got lights flashing. You got emails coming in. You got CISOs down your neck wondering what's going on. It's fast paced, hyper. What's going on? Let's get taken care of now. Digital forensics is more of a methodical build a puzzle, find a solution. Something has happened. There's been uh, a murder or a kidnapping or getting ready to do drug raid, that type of thing. So, um, what information can be gathered to prove uh, that the suspect was involved with the incident? So, it's a book called Placing the Suspect Behind the Keyboard by Brett Shavers, who is one of the OG uh, digital forensics guys. He's got several books, very friendly. He helped me out with some of this talk. Um, and so, it's, it's, pretty, it's very non-technical. I mentioned my talk is non-technical. It's kind of very basic. Uh, information on what level of title says. So, uh, so it talks about putting the person at the place at the time of the incident and how do you gather that information and how do we collect it and how do we collect it. So the difference between the two is high pace, get things done now, or find the clues, escape the room. Uh, we're going to focus more on the digital forensic side today. Uh, so here's a high level view of the process. We're going to identify what, what devices we have out there, what data can we find, what data can we use. We're going to collect that data. How do we keep it safe? Obviously, you don't want to wipe out the hard drive that's got all the evidence on it. Uh, that would be bad. Uh, <coughs> then analysis, which is where most of us probably enjoy getting our hands dirty, digging around, looking at browser histories, finding pictures, gathering information, doing that detective work, and then documenting what we did, what we found, and presenting it in court as software where it will end up. So, do we have anybody here that does this type of digital forensics? Well, they all want to do. Used to. In law enforcement? No. No. Okay. So, well, I guess we should go back. So, this right here is exactly why I wanted to do the talk. So, when I walked away from that, that conference, I had heard about products and vendors and open source tools that I had never heard of before. And I've been to several B-sides and other conferences. This topic has never come up. I went to one conference earlier in the year where I was talking to the organizer, and the organizer said, you want to talk to this lady that's sitting right over here. She's giving a presentation exactly on that today. And I went and chatted with her. I said, can I talk to you after your talk? I'm excited to learn about what you're doing. And the talk that she gave, she didn't know digital forensics. She was talking about the products and what they do, but she didn't know it. So I wanted to kind of open it up and introduce this. Obviously, there's nobody that's doing it here. I assume that means many people haven't heard you know, how it's used in law enforcement. So I just want to get that out there. You do do it in law enforcement. So if I say magnet forensics, 
I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Okay. Uh, if you can come to me, that'd be great. Because right now, everybody's in their underwear, and I don't want them to be like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, so I'm, I'm here to introduce you to something. Hopefully, you guys, somebody gets interested, walks away, goes home, and tries some schools tomorrow. Uh, yeah, this is Find out what's out there. So, it's a little bit more about each step of the process. What information do we need to collect? So we've got a suspect. They've been arrested. Um, during that process, they collected a uh, uh, laptop in the phone. As examiners, we can look at that phone and determine what else is it connected to. We can look at the laptop and see what USB devices are connected to it. So now we take that information and we build a search warrant so they can go back to the residents and say, we need USB drives, digital cameras, green cameras, Nest thermostats. I mean, everybody knows data is everywhere. That's two two parts of the the title: drones, prison phones. I put those both in there because one of the vendors told two stories: drones. We all know it collects GPS data, right? So we can know where it started. We can get back to that. That's important in law enforcement because criminals from the outside are buying cheap drones, sending contraband in over the wall, dropping it in the yard. Who cares if we lose $99 a drone, we've got our drones inside. So now the law enforcement is collecting that, getting that information and turning it back where it's coming from. Same with prison phones, little tiny phones that are easily hidden. And then people are going out making phone calls to people on the outside. So, uh, I kind of got tickled this week thinking about all the prison phones that went off at 2.20 on Tuesday. <laughs> 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 And then lost them that afternoon. So uh, I don't know if that really happened, but it's, uh, now obviously once we have the warrant, we have to go out and collect that information, bring it back, and then we start the documentation of our process of uh, what's right here, chain of custody. So in law enforcement, and any of us investigation is going to be important. You know, who has the evidence? The other side is going to say this person touched it. They made changes, so we need to be able to keep track of who touched it, what we did with it, uh, and, and uh, pass that along as the evidence goes. That's just going to that's just going to be a simple document of uh, uh, an evidence ID number, probably a serial number if possible, maybe a picture, who took possession of it, date, uh, that type of thing, and then uh, document the process of what was done with it. Uh, prevention. I mentioned we don't want to lose data. We don't want to change data. We don't want um, to. Uh, so there, there's a concern, and, and we'll look at some hardware later that helps us prevent that. But in a uh, uh, in, in, the, in the crime organ, criminal organizations, they are technically advanced enough now that they get a phone call that Johnny's been arrested. And they go push a button and wipe his phone. So what do we do to prevent that from happening? How do we keep that phone from getting wiped with that data? Um, if we're pounding on the door and, and hacking the hoodie, it's the, the delete all button. What do we do to rush in and, and save that? We need to be prepared to do that. Um, uh, uh, Where can we get data? Hardware, we talked about it. Just list off a bunch. Anybody have anything extra? I mean, every device in your home is going to collect information from everybody. Usually, when it's reliable. Well, that's that's down there as well. Yeah. Services in cloud. So we, we've got all the hardware that's there. We've got all the software, some applications. Yes, sir. You can say radio frequency is the stuff that's being transmitted over the air. Absolutely, way past anything I understand. But if there's a way to collect it, absolutely. Uh, or ISP. ISP. Yep. I, I have a question for you. How how would they? Like, say you want to collect data off a hard drive or something, right? Yep. But the hard drive's in the cloud. Right. So you just get a... They, they're not going to mail you the hard drive from Amazon or Google, but... I don't know the answer to that. I imagine, though, that there's search warrants and there's processes involved to say we need, okay. to, we need, oh. we need to get an image of this server. It just, yeah, it leads to more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. so yeah. I'm sure there's a law enforcement process. I, I know that... Reading enough stories in the news, I know that there are there are request processes high. Um, I'm sure they're prepared for it. I'm sure they have resources to do it as little as often as they can. Um, 
put services in the cloud, so everything's in Google, right? All your email, um, all your GPS travel information, pictures. Um, OneDrive's got all your files that are backed up. Your backup provider's got your files. So everything, everything's there. Um, there's several places to look. Urgency and time considerations. So I talked about this being a slow, methodical, let's gather information to look at. But now we've got, to, on the flip side, there's opportunity. You know, what if we're dealing with a kidnapping case? Like somebody's been taken. What if there's a threat at the high school football game? What if there's child abuse going on? These, these are things that, um, that do speed up the timeline. They make you be a little bit less strict about the process. The flip side of that is you could create the risk of not getting enough information, not getting enough right information early enough, modifying things. It's just part of the process to consider uh, when, you're, when you're getting ready to plan your attack on gathering that information. Bypass security, everybody's phones are locked. Everybody knows the debate about passwords and biometrics, what's personal data, what's protected data, what's not. Uh, at, at this step, it's as simple as asking the suspect, hey, what do you want the phone for? So you give us your password. Sometimes they'll do it because it's, you know, they're being cooperative. That's going to help them out in the end. Uh, if not, there are tools, vendors, we'll talk about some vendors a little bit, hopefully, that uh, they have tools built in. They will just sit there and have passwords to try to get signed in. You can probably all use the Linux boot CD to just like into a Windows machine to change the password. So those are, those are tools that are available as well. Volatility orders. So now we're talking about what information, all the information that's out there that we want to play. What do we have the chance of losing? The students. So memory, right? Tons of information, and other passwords in memory. We know there's other information sitting out there. We need to capture that first because as soon as we, we start doing stuff to the machine, memory's changing. Okay, we need, so we need to gather that information, do it so we don't affect anything, get as much as we can. Next thing down is office documents. So you open the document, temp file's created, let's cut that temp file, make sure that's saved so that it's showing, you know, that's keeping track of the changes that have been made to the document. If that information's been deleted from the document, it could be in that temp file. We'll make sure it gets that before word is closed that temp file goes away. Uh, remote data, we talked about services and ISPs and that type of thing. And then you've got the physical data on the disk, the local disk, information you can collect, archive media. I mean, there's going to be some guy that's got lots of videos that he wants to save, and for some reason he's still putting them on DVDs in the folder sitting on a shelf somewhere. So you can collect that information. So now that we have the devices, we know what information we want. Uh, the fun begins, and this is where we dig in, and we start looking at the image. So, my title is Clones, Drones, and Prison Phones. Clones is a lie. The clone is just an image, it's a, it's a, it's a copy of data from one device. There's something I've learned along the way, but everything rhymes, but I didn't want to change the title. Uh, so we know, Clone is, you know, I'm going to take data from this drive. So when you buy a new hard drive, you put it in, you've got the vendor application that says, copy all the data from here to here, and do it to the new drive. What we want is a forensic image, which is a bit level, one to one image of those devices. So that's going to get us all the data that's on there, plus everything that was deleted. And we all know that when a file is deleted, it's not really gone, it's just marked to be that space to be used again. That forensic image lets us have tools that will go and look at that, those files and gather more information. So if that, if that hacker would really want to go and push the button to delete stuff, we can pull that back, that data back. And then we dig around and we play. Uh, and we seriously play. And we, uh, we start building that case. What can we find? We talked about all the different things, PCs, phones, cloud services. Um, Documentation. Nobody likes documentation, but this is important in law enforcement because you have to prove why you believe the outcome that you came up with. So, document everything. I tried this, it didn't work. I tried this, it did work. That's great. I gathered this information. Can you repeat it so that you can prove later on if you're sitting in court? This is valid. You've got the other side of the courtroom that's working with the same day that you are trying to come up with a different summary of what happened. I can't comprehend how that works. Uh, 
is I work for a managed service provider in North Atlanta. Uh, I am the knock manager. Uh, I've been working with managed service providers for 20 years doing the same type of thing. So in our current environment, we manage about 9,000 endpoints for multiple clients. I'm in charge of our internal systems, our ticketing system, our alerting system, and then anything that touches all the workstation servers. So So we talked earlier about preserving a device. Uh, these little bags, they're kind of hard to see, they're Faraday bags. So um, I actually have one here. I have a problem. Um, slide on the inside. This company actually sells baseball caps with this lining on here, so you can really buy a foil hat. You click the device. First thing we gotta do is make sure it's unlocked. And second thing we're gonna do is get on there, make sure it doesn't lock itself now that we have it unlocked. Third, we're gonna make sure it's got power. So you can take a, an external power supply, hook it up to your phone, tuck it in this bag, flip it over, and it's protected. So those, those people that are trying to wipe it from outside you can't get to it. Um, this is a very new box. So when you get back to the lab and you need to work on that phone, you can take this, take the phone. In the back, drop it in the box, close the lid. You'll see right here. Here's external power sources. So you can copy down into an external forensic machine. Lid comes down. You imagine this is that was something that you did. Like, imagine the lid's closed. You got your arms in here working on so. They make them bigger. They make pop-up tents. So if you are on site for a raid of some sort and you've got multiple machines you can work on, they they got full-blown pop-up tents. So you can Bring in one place you can see down there. Right blockers, there are hardware and software right blockers. Basically, what this is, is we're going to plug the source drive, is going to be the evidence drive. We're going to plug it in here. We're going to plug our workstation in on this side or our target drive to move data to. This is going to prevent any write to that device. So, any, any, any OS level. Request to hit that drive to make a change to be denied. Um, and then you know, there's, there's software that does the same thing. For those who do some of the um, I mentioned a forensic workstation. So I learned very quickly that was, uh, has everybody heard of Celebrite? It's a name that's kind of been in the news and gets picked on every now and then. Have heard of it before. Uh, they had a CTF last week. I signed up, I downloaded the trial software, installed it on my daily driver, mounted the image that I wanted it to analyze, went to bed, and woke up the next morning and it was at like 12% done. This was a 30 something gig image. I don't mean, have the most powerful machine. I don't notice any problems on the computer. But obviously, sell by the more power. So I went got my son's old gaming PC. So I was not able to compete in the CTF, but I still was on Discord talking to people asking questions. And there was one guy who was bragging that he had four, he had all four of the images open at once. He was able to look at all of them at once. I was like, what type of power do you have? 48 cores, half a terabyte of RAM. Intel Xeon, gold, something, something. I don't even know. So these two vendors, Samuri and Bitmines, will build custom PCs. I'm sure at some point everybody's gone to Dell and said, I want everything on $12,000. <laughs> I, I was just updating stuff and I was getting $75,000 for my desktop workstation. Uh, so that, that's, 
definitely a consideration. And I think it's probably part of, you know, everybody's got a budget need that probably it's hard for law enforcement to get that type of stuff. Another thing is storage considerations. So everything we're working with is an, is a, is an image of the original data. As soon as we make, as soon as we take that image of the original data, we take that drive, and we it's inventory, it's out of the way. We don't want anybody messing with it. We're working with images. So right now we've got a storage need of one to one. In the CTFs that I have done in the past, of images anywhere from eight to thirty something gig, the resulting reports that the software analyzes fifty percent of the data. So multiply that up to terabytes of data, talking about lots of space to get. I don't know. One question I have for law enforcement, but I've not been able to find anybody to tell me what, what do you do. And I assume they can't reuse those drives. So I don't know if they have a bookshelf somewhere that's just got a ton of hard drives to call and they use once. I don't know, but it's, it's just another cost as you're building out these machines uh, from the, the previous vendors. You have options to, I mean, they, they'll do anything, but you can, you can raid your OS image, you can set up a, a multiple disk raid for your database processing part and for the image itself. So you end up, you end up with a whole bunch of drives. You know, Hardware related, this is JTAG and chip off. People may have heard of JTAG. Uh, it's, this would be used in the case of a phone that's been crushed, it's been burned, it's been water damaged. We can't hook the cable up to it anymore. We can't power it on. Older phones have a JTAG port where you can uh, connect specific wires to specific equipment, read the data directly off the chip. The chip off process is actually desoldering the chip from the board and either hooking it up to a device to read the information, or in some cases, if you can get a one-to-one -one matching of the exact same phone, model, board, everything, you can actually take the chip off the good board, take the chip from that board, put it on that new phone, and then you can read it up to what you want. Some challenges there, because now there are other chips involved in encryption, you've got to take your multiple chips off. Uh, this is risky, but it's also the last to uh, get to that information. Talk about a little bit of vendors now. Uh, <coughs> Point Forensics is down in Florida, I believe. They have this cool little box. Yes. It's a screen deck. They put a Linux board behind it. Uh, their goal is uh, so assume there's a raid and we've got 40 computers that we have to go through. Assuming on a good day with those powerful machines. Got a terabyte drive, it's still gonna take four or five hours. We're talking about a few couple hundred hours to process all that data. They're optimizing, they want to optimize that and go and inventory the drives quickly and tell you what's on it. So this 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 drive here has got tons of pictures. Let's give that a higher priority for the further investigation. This one just looks like it was a workstation with a few documents, it's not worried about that kind of with this expensive workstation, you're not going to be able to do all 40 at once. So let's figure out what we can do. Each of these buttons has got a different process. You can go down deeper, but you can do things. You, know, you can capture all the images. Push that button. Uh, here's the storage drive plugged in here. Workstation <laughs> drive. It doesn't actually involve the workstation. I have a blocker built into it. Push that button. It's going to only dump the information about all the images. Uh, so it's going to go and look at all the it's going to look at the deleted slack space on the drive. What has been deleted? What can what can you get back? Uh, there's a bunch of formats you can do. Say why you need to rewipe fire scan. But you want to make sure the drives are clean before you hook them up to your workstation. Maybe a shout out from our friends that she is one thing that's very excited about this talk to us. Big vendor names. There are tons of companies out there that have a product that does something similar. These are all the same thing. They're all slicing up with it. They all generate a report. There are different costs, different levels, there's different bells and whistles. There's, there's just the product about this. This guy's like law enforcement. Everybody likes law enforcement. But interfaces are interfaces are more friendly. I, I can tell you. Same size as this company, the CTFs. My data driver is fine. It can process it back. In the end, this one is the CTF. These are some free tools. When I talk about you going home tomorrow and doing something on your own, these are free and these are available. FTK Imager, 
bank and acquire. These are both parts of bigger suites from previous companies. Uh, these are free portions. So if the game is for me, you could very good about getting hard drive images. So if you want to you run that on your workstation or your laptop, again, you that's a very good job with that. Bank and acquire is good for phones, mobile devices, tablets. Um, but I still have not figured out uh, the magic ingredient to get a true phone image. Uh, closest I've gotten is something that will, well, many cars will be able to do it, that will uh, work off an iTunes backup to create an image, but it still didn't get everything I expected it to, so I think that's the project that they work on. And the autopsy is a free version of the full blown suites. And then you can shoot through that 38 gig image pretty quickly compared to seller type. So here's your project where we can go and reach something run that tool and see what you get back. This is a suite of tools, open source, based off Python, I think. You don't need it, they've got an executable they built for Windows. Uh, there are a ton of people that uh, have contributed to this every time there's a new update to iOS, every time there's a new application. <coughs> and blank parser, each of the devices have a, has a different keyword in that blank. Uh, very friendly. Run the tool, tell it what you want back. It's an HTML in an index file that links to a whole bunch of information. If we have some time, I'll, I'll fire one of those up so we can kind of see what, what's coming back. These are just other suites of tools that are out there. Uh, just questions of tools, nothing special. tools right here, again, from major vendors. We'll go out and, and grab that RAM. These work great for me. That's where volatility comes in. This is uh, a popular tool. Open source, does anybody know? Hunter's Labs, does that name sound familiar? So Jamie Levy is with all the with the incident response to Hunter's Labs. One of the developers here is actually doing a talk for the webinar next Tuesday. Some full blown suites, obviously Linux based. Some people will say that Kali Linux is a forensic machine. I learned, and people will tell you that it's not, it's a Linux machine that has some for these tools. Summary again is the hardware vendor from earlier, they've got their own Linux distribution. Security Linux is kind of an opinion about the idea of their technical development gas, it's giving some training, uh, and they are fully focused on doing. Sans has a, um, a suite of tools that you can drop on top of Linux on your own. So you don't have the full distribution, but you can build it. Um, as I mentioned, Sans, Sans has a, um, Sans is 
probably uh, a good resource for DFIR stuff. If you go to sans.org slash DFIR, it'll take you straight to their page. You can sign up for the newsletters. You can sign up for the They always have they've got two or three virtual summits a year. What they're working on. So now I'm going to start talking about where you can go to gather information. So you can start. Anybody have any questions before that? Is it because you're all hungry or I'm just doing such an awesome job? Startme.stock 4n6.com, 4n6, 4n6 is a program. This is built by Kevin Pagano. He does enterprise forensics. Episode one.
professor with the Science. These are these are two organizations that recognize about for computer investigation.